For this episode of Cloud Hacking, I have Carlos and Gabby joining me again. And this time we're going to take a look at some of the vulnerabilities that their team has found or maybe they have read about or analyzed online and see what they look like when it comes down to approaching Web3, smart contracts, and even crypto platforms or exchanges. So let's roll the clip and see what it's like. Thank you guys for joining me again. I know last episode we talked about at a high level, Web3, Web2, there's not much of a difference really. It's practically the same. But for this episode, I kind of want to talk about those exact vulnerabilities. You know, like I come from a bug bounty perspective of like finding server-side vulnerabilities like SSRF, RCEs, that kind of stuff. And I kind of want to see if that is, how relatable that is with Web3. So is there like, um, you know, for example, like when I approach an application, I look for an SSRF, I own the keys, I can get into the infrastructure. How does that look with Web3? What would be the worst case of me having AWS keys, for example? Um, I will say that it's just the same like in a traditional Web2 uh, company, because at the end, these Web3 companies, they are going to be having the infrastructure, their servers, their web pages. So you actually can do that. Uh, you might not be able to modify contracts, obviously, but you can still compromise the infrastructure. And because the clients are the one using that infrastructure to manage their funds, you will still be able to compromise the funds of the users. So it's still pretty dangerous. As you have said, um, I think that the most um, dangerous things you could achieve could be some RC, some SSRF, where you are is, start stealing credentials. But in this case, uh, as I have commented, like, I don't know, imagine that you're attacking uh, this uh, shop that they are selling some stuff. Maybe the, the, the most dangerous thing you could do there is, well, I, I start spinning up new machines and I start uh, crypto mining or I start making money somehow or, or even doing a ransomware and stealing the money, but they don't have direct access to some funds. In Web3, they do. So the most dangerous thing you can do is let's abuse these uh, compromised credentials, let's change the infrastructure and let's make the users send me their money. And because you can do that kind of easily with social engineering once you are managing the main um, the main servers, you can really steal data, they really steal money. That's why this is so in, uh, important dangerous. Yeah, that's the problem is managing private keys is a huge problem because if you take a look, maybe you can find in GitHub in any test, the private key directly in terms of testing. But so, some developers or some companies, they say, okay, but it's for the test net. But you know, when you create an account in MetaMask, you have the same address and the same private key in the testnet and in the mainnet. So at the end, you have the, you have the private keys. So as Carlos said, it's like, you know, you have the private keys. We said, if you have the private keys, you have the money. So uh, this point is like, uh, is super dangerous and is again, Web2 thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like, it goes with the same thing of like AWS keys, right? If they think that it's not gated, if you have access to a particular service, then you can manipulate those services. Uh, you mentioned GitHub. I think um, Shiba had their credentials yeah. completely leaked on GitHub not too long ago, right? Then someone could have probably connected, depending on what access it had, what the IAM role look like or what permissions looked like. They could have probably spun up a lot of different things. And as you were talking about the the money draining thing, like I, there's another you know completely different story. But I also saw people were you know, people can do subdomain takeovers or DNS hijacking, mm -hmm. right? With today's NFT, if a company gets owned, they could put up a fake NFT when people are you know buying these drops. But in reality, there's no drops, and the money's going to somebody else, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just cool to see how that works. And you know, for someone who has done a lot of Web two, I've always and I'm learning about Web3, I was kind of giving up on like, oh, you know, how do I change that SSRF into a Web3 thing? But it looks like I can still go after these exchanges because they could be vulnerable to the same thing. You just will need to understand how then you need to compromise uh, correctly the infrastructure in order to, to steal the funds. Actually, do, as you said, like you can do these subdomain takeovers. I remember this vulnerability. I don't remember the company was uh, that was uh, compromised. Maybe Gabi will remember. But... Uh, the attackers didn't even compromise the infrastructure. They just compromised the DNS infrastructure hosting the DNS mm -hmm. records. And they just changed the main domain to their IP address where they ha have put the same web page, 
but with a malicious JavaScript to mm -hmm. steal the funds. So you don't even need to to compromise the infrastructure. Just uh, compromising the DNS servers is is, yeah. is it enough. was it was the curve attack. Okay. Curve five, curve of finance. Yeah. And another thing is you know managing uh, private keys. I don't know if you heard about the winter mute attack. Basically, the company generate the address because you know what is the vanity address. A vanity address in Ethereum is like you have your public key, but maybe it's long, difficult to remember all the numbers and letters. So you say, okay, I'm going to generate a new account, but it's a vanity address, you know, like in Discord. It's like maybe nahanset.eth, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. super cool. And you put in MetaMask, and you can send money to you without knowing your public key. So many people generated this many years ago, I think three years ago, with using a tool called Profanity. So this company generated all the address using Profanity and the pseudo random generation was not good. So one guy, you know, stayed like uh, during, I think in 30 days, he got all the possible private keys and he started to steal money importing private keys. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and this is simple, right? Because uh, yeah, generating private keys is super important. How you generate, how you manage, who has this part on the other, even Samir's secret or something. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, I'm starting to see like um, what you mean by, so when you the compromise, the attack is the same as Web2, but how you compromise, yeah. the threat model is a little bit different. <laughs> And more profitable, <laughs> way more profitable. I mean, when you breach a company, you, you know, you sell the PII pretty much. You know, but when that happens, and then they, they go and sell the PII or whatever, it, it leaks. But I feel like with Web3 stuff, it's a lot of just money being drained, as you guys were mentioning. Exactly. I'm, I'm feeling that you are going to start doing more about bounty in Web3 companies. I want to. I feel like uh, I have to figure out how I translate those Web2 skills mm -hmm. to a Web3. I've just never... I just didn't, for some reason, I never thought about, you know, I can go after the, the infrastructure. I could go after these, the, you know, the plugins or things that they use to connect different infrastructures together. But it sounded looked like it could still be a very lucrative <laughs> thing to do. Uh, one of the other really, like, um, cool, interesting vulnerabilities is uh, dependency confusion. And I know with the, the, a lot of these uh, projects and a lot of these uh, smart contracts, there are a very few like, popular and common libraries that are being used. Has there ever been any like dependency confusion attacks that ever happened um, that could be that affected a bunch of wallets, maybe or an exchange or a contract? So if I can um, talk pretty good about my cloud team here in Halborn, I have to say that actually was a member of the cloud team, the one that discovered that uh, AWS Cody Artifact was vulnerable to dependency confusion. And this was uh, last year, I think, just after this uh, very famous blog post about uh, dependency confusion came out. Mm -hmm. And the thing was that, well, he, he got in touch with AWS, obviously they, they fixed it. Uh, but when I was talking to him, like, okay, well, how did they fix it? Is it still, uh, there could be some potential companies still vulnerable or whatever. The thing is that AWS now, they don't allow the dependency confusion to be a vulnerability. I mean, if you mistype a, a, a library or whatever, it's not going to be downloaded into the public source if you don't allow it. The thing is that if you had that vulnerability previously to the fix, he told me that these companies need to uh, set up these protections. So there could still be actually a lot of uh, vulnerable companies out there using code artifacts, and that's definitely a problem because we, we know how dangerous this vulnerability could be and how easily you could compromise uh, the computer of hundreds of different developers with just a mistype or, or just because they are you just upload uh, the same name of the same library into the public repo with a new version. Yeah. Wow, okay. Has there been an example of that at all? Has there been a, you know, I know Open Zeppelin is a really big library that's you know that's been mentioned a bunch of times in the smart contract series that I did. Has there been any attacks towards you know that, that involved Open Zeppelin at yeah, all? Not not really a, an attack, but you know if you smart contracts they have a lot of inheritance there. So if you import the wrong smart contract, you can change completely a function. So and other than that, I saw in uh, Rust for example, you know Solana 
and, and near and substrate smart contracts, they are written in Rust. So for importing libraries, crates are called crates in Rust. I saw a reverse shell in, when you import the wrong crate. <laughs> so when you put cargo run, and then suddenly you have a reverse shell, and it's not related to smart contract at all. But you know, if you manipulate the libraries, and that's the problem, it's like open source, everyone, you know, anyone can upload the library, update the crate, it's, the crates are maintained by people. Yeah, yeah, incredible to see, like, I, I don't have done a lot of, I haven't done a lot of uh, Rust stuff, but people that are watching crate is pretty much like doing APT or uh, PIP or something like that for, um, for Rust. But it's incredible to know as you run it, it just drops in a reverse shell for somebody else. And that was that um, some sort of a breach that's happened, or you think that's a theoretical thing that happened in the past? Uh, actually, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it for a client because a library, you know, when a library is no no longer maintained in in this in this web page of crate.io, I think yeah. is the name. So when when it's no longer maintained, it's like nobody is using, but you can update it. Yeah. So I uploaded a crate and then my client ran cargo run and I got a reversal. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, it's just it's getting the gears moving for me a little bit. That's a very cool way to uh, to go after one of your clients by just, you know, you pretty much are introducing some sort of a confusion by just leveraging uh, how Rust uses crate. That's very cool. Um, I think for this one I think it's a good place for us to stop. I know we have more episodes coming up. Um, before we do anything, you know, we, we wrap this up. Is there anything you guys want to add to the episode before we wrap it up? Um, cloud works. <laughs> yeah, I and mean, also, you know, all the frameworks for testing and everything and for developers, uh, they, they have NPM packets. So yeah. at the end, you are importing the libraries directly from uh, NPM packets. You are importing a lot of things. If these libraries are manipulated or something you think you are deploying the right contract but it's not wow very cool okay i think we will we'll, we'll, we'll stop this right now i think the next episode uh, carlos and i are going to look at actual vulnerabilities specific to aws mm -hmm. and gcp so if you're watching this come back next week we're going to do some actual demos and walks of vulnerabilities and maybe we'll cover some of the stuff that we talked about in this episode Okay, that's it. That was it. Those are the only two intros we're going to have. Next week, it's going to be actually hands-on. We're going to bring Carlos back, and we're going to look at two or three specific vulnerabilities that could happen in the cloud. Maybe we'll talk about SSRF a little bit. Who knows? But this time, we're going to for sure bring on some hands-on experience to this, have the screen share, and show you guys what they look like. And then the week after that, we're going to look into AWS and GCP specifically. So I'll see you all next week. 